quite ambitious. Uh, speaking of Stanford, <clears throat> um, our next speaker, Angela Fleischman, did uh, begin her interest in blood development during her PhD graduate studies there. Uh, after graduating with an MD PhD there, she went to Oregon Health System uh, and then on to uh, University of California. She's going to speak to us on uh, the integration of her research with the clinical care of patients in the realm of nutrition and the role of inflammation and myeloproliferative disorders. Uh, just a word to everybody, we are not panicked about time, we're doing good. We are probably going to go straight into breakout groups uh, at about three, so you'll have time with us and then we'll be ending sharply at four, and this is Arizona time. Uh, do the math. So. Dr. Fleischman, thank you for making it there. I see your face. I know you're here now uh, yeah. somewhere, and uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, th thank you so much for for this opportunity to talk today. This is my um, my first time experiencing this meeting. Um, I've heard a lot about it um, from patients, um, and so I'm I'm really honored to have this opportunity to to talk today. Um, if I can, let me. try try to figure out this my entire screen let me try this the share oh, okay share um just bear with me please um can people see my ooh, people see my screen yes yes see it. okay perfect um so i am um, a physician scientist in myeloproliferative neoplasms i focused on, on mpns um since i was an intern um it, to me, it's just a, a fascinating disease that we need to learn a lot about still, um, as well as although there's there's relative there's great therapies for MPNs at the present time, um, there's a lot of a lot of room for improvement. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about um, the role of nutrition in MPNs, and in particular, um, describing a, a recent study that we just did investigating uh, a Mediterranean diet in patients with MPN. Um, so as we've heard earlier today, um, I'll, I wanna drive home the point that um, inflammatory cytokines are very important in uh, myeloproliferative neoplasms, not only for um, the disease pathogenesis, but also um, in, in terms of, they drive a lot of the symptom burden. Um, on the left um, are, different types of inflammatory cytokines that are seen in different types of blood cancers. And the purpose of this is just to demonstrate that a lot of things, a lot of different blood cancers have increased cytokines in common, um, and some have particular cytokines that are increased in one versus the other, but particular cytokines such as TNF-alpha and IL-6 are upregulated in, in many um, different types of blood cancers. Um, and these inflammatory cytokines can increase um, and worsen um, some of the uh, MPN-related symptoms, such as fatigue, which is commonly um, seen in MPN patients, as well as uh, blood clots, which is a major complication in MPN. And there's a lot of challenges of treatment and MPN, as we've heard today. We're making some great headway, but still have a lot of challenges. Um, MPN is a, is a disease in which um, the symptoms are well recognized and we have great ways of measuring oh, yeah. symptoms and um, are addressing symptoms, um, but it's still still in under recognized, um, in particular in early stage patients such as in PV or ET, um, because most of the therapies focus on blood counts. You could go to your doctor and you could feel really poorly, but the doctor says, gee, look, your blood counts look great. Um, and that's the end of the story, not really um, acknowledging that um, it's not all just blood counts, the um, symptoms are, are also really important. And at many, particularly early stage patients are treated with watch and weight management. And it's frustrating for the patient and the physician um, to many times not do something proactive about changing uh, the disease trajectory. All patients undergo platelet, antiplatelet treatments like with aspirin, and we have minimal number of FDA approved drugs, um, such as JAK inhibitors. Um, the definitive cure is a bone marrow transplant, but um, there are significant risks of transplant and really transplants are not um, appropriate for, for uh, many MPN patients. Um, so 
based on the rationale that symptom burden has a major impact on the quality of life in MPN patients, and we need something to focus on um, managing symptoms, um, in addition to preventing disease progression with low or um, no risk intervention, um, we thought that diet might represent a great, um, a great way to do this because there's really, there's no harm in, in having a good diet. I mean, whether you have an MPN or you don't have an MPN, um, improving your diet is always a good idea. Um, so we thought, what sorts of diets could we use um, that would be a well-regarded anti-inflammatory diet. And um, as you heard earlier today, um, there's been um, some really strong evidence um, for a Mediterranean diet um, in terms of improving metabolic disease um, and improving uh, cardiovascular disease and subclinical inflammation. And this is the, um, the same trial that was um, uh, described earlier today about the, uh, the PREDIMED trial on uh, the impact of a Mediterranean diet in cardiovascular disease. And in this diet, um, which uh, was a Mediterranean diet that was supplemented with extra virgin olive oil or nuts, um, did improve outcomes or, or uh, cardiovascular events, as well as biological markers of inflammation. So we thought the Mediterranean diet is a, a, a good option um, to start with um, for um, anti-inflammatory diets. So what's the properties of a Mediterranean diet? Um, because it includes lots of fresh fruits and vegetables and whole grains, is increased in fiber. Um, reservatrol, which is an antioxidant, which is seen in, um, in red wine. And um, the majority of the fats are from monounsaturated fats coming from, um, in particular, a key component is uh, the majority of the fats come from uh, olive oil. And so our hypothesis is that if somebody follows a Mediterranean diet, that might reduce the inflammatory cytokines in an MPN patient and reduce their symptom burden and also possibly blunt their disease trajectory. So this was our study design. Um, we needed to start somewhere um, and clinical trials um, need to, to move a one step at a time. So this was a pilot study in which we enrolled 28 patients in the Southern California area. Um, we randomized um, half of the, or 15 to the Mediterranean diet, um, which as I described um, has um, these um, components, um, really eat red meats very few times um, per month, uh, minimal sweets, minimal eggs, um, more fish, um, and um, heavy on things like olive oil, fruits and vegetables, and whole grains. And then the other half was randomized to what we would say is a standard diet, such as the standard USDA um, recommendations for adults. Um, and those are your standard, if you see things on the internet about the, the when you have a plate and the, the uh, little portions of the plate, these are just their standard recommendations for, for Americans. Um, and it, throughout this study, what we did was we had a two-week lead-in period where we basically just wanted to see what people were eating and how they were feeling just in their natural environment, just, just their baseline. Um, and then we had a dietary intervention period in which patients had um, in-person dietitian counseling. Um, and then we had a follow-up period where patients no longer were getting active uh, curriculum and guidance on the diet um, for the purpose of seeing if we give them um, some e education, um, even after we're, we're done with giving them the education, will they continue to, to follow the diet? So a part of this study, um, we also drew a bio biology samples, um, such as a blood draw um, for cytokines, as well as for other um, measures such as CBCs and chemistries and cholesterol. Also uh, did stool samples um, uh, to look at the microbiome. We were interested in seeing how the microbiome changed with the diet, as well as urine samples as, a, as another way to assess um, their intake of, of components of a Mediterranean diet, such as olive oil. Um, patients also filled out questionnaires um, uh, regarding how they were feeling 
and how they were what they were eating at different time points during during the diet intervention um, and then had uh, one on one uh, dietitian uh, visits um, three times during the dietary intervention. And because we wanted to gear it somewhat like the, that that med diet that was um, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, we also gave people um, olive oil who were in the Mediterranean diet group and a $10 or $10 gift card if they were in the standard diet to try to help them um, adhere to their, their particular diet a little bit better. And we also produced these colorful PDF um, curriculums, um, which people were given um, via email once per week um, to try to keep them engaged and give them little, um, little bits of information each week on recipes or tidbits about um, certain interesting facts about um, either the Mediterranean diet or just the standard uh, healthy diet. Uh, these are our patient demographics. Um, we had a smattering of all P MPN groups, PB, ET, and MF. Um, as would be expected for a general MPN population, the majority were um, power reticulin mutated. Um, and then the treatments that people were on um, varied. We gave them the MPN SAF uh, form, which probably a lot of you have seen um, that rates um, common uh, symptoms that are seen in patients with MPN. Uh, we also um, gave people uh, this 14-point um, questionnaire called the Mediterranean Diet Adherence Score, um, which asked questions um, particularly about the components of the Mediterranean diet. Um, and our primary objective with this study um, was simply to see whether if we give people a Mediterranean diet uh, curriculum and guidance, are they able to actually increase their adherence to a Mediterranean diet? So the green is the Mediterranean diet um, group um, and the black is the USDA group. And um, the green group, the Mediterranean diet group was able to um, increase their score on the Mediterranean diet adherence score. We regard a score of about eight as a good adherence. And over 80% of the Mediterranean diet people were able to adhere. So this is demonstrating that if you give people, and if you give MPN patients guidance, they're able to follow a particular diet. And then we also looked at um, symptom burden um, and this is called a waterfall plot with, with each bar being a person um, and comparing their symptoms at week nine versus their baseline. So week nine is sort of in the middle of the intervention period. Um, and on this slide, we're um, uh, the separating people based on their adherence score. Um, so the red is adherence, good adherers, and the blue is people who really didn't adhere to a Mediterranean diet. And as you can see, uh, the people who adhered to a Mediterranean diet, 42% of them had a reduction in their symptom score. Um, in this slide, it's not uh, separating people based on what they were randomized to, but whether they were adherent, the dark, um, the darker shades of the bars are the people who were in the randomized to Mediterranean and the lighter shades are the people who are randomized to the USDA. Um, we also asked very extensive 24-hour uh, diet recalls, um, which are, are a little um, laborious to do um, for participants, but really do give a lot of information about exactly what the person is eating over a 24-hour period. Um, and gives also um, detailed information about particular components and vitamins that people are taking in. Um, and this is just um, showing we, particular things that we were interested in um, because increased fiber um, has been associated with um, better general, general health, uh, wondering whether um, people on the Mediterranean diet increase their fiber intake. Um, and it, it seems conceivable that that would be the case if they're uh, being recommended a diet that's really um, rich in fresh fruits and vegetables, low in processed, um, processed foods. 
Um, and um, both males and females in the Mediterranean diet, that's the blue, um, had inc increased fiber intake per day as compared to the USDA standard diet. And we also um, wanted to look at the microbiome as I discussed before. Um, so we took um, longitudinal samples um, from people, they gave us stool samples um, before they started the diet, during the, start, during the diet, and then after, after um, we had um, finished giving them, giving them the diet intervention um, because we wanted to see how, um, how the diet changed their microbiome. Um, because gut microbiome is becoming a very hot topic in inflammation, um, as well as other um, chronic diseases, including blood cancers. Uh, so what we did is we took four samples from each person. Um, we uh, did what's called um, shotgun sequencing of their, um, of their stool samples to identify what types of bacteria are in their stool. Um, and then... Uh, and then assessed um, how they changed over time and whether there were any correlations between um, which diet they were on, um, their adherence to a Mediterranean diet, their symptom burden, um, and what, what components, um, what bacterial components they have in their, in their stool. Um, the analysis is ongoing, um, but just wanted to show you um, the sort of data that we get out. So um, the microbiome analysis is is quite a complicated analysis and there's quite a bit of variation um, person to person. So each person has a very unique microbiome, sort of like their, their fingerprint that they, everybody is really, really different. Um, and this is just a visualization of each person, um, each of the bars, each of the, there's a, there's a white space in between each person, um, but the, the four bars that are right next to each other are each person over time. Um, and as you can see, each person really looks a lot more like themselves than um, any other person in the whole cohort. Um, but one can visually pick out that over time, in some people, there are some changes in the composition of their, of their microbiome. And so we're looking more into this as to um, identification of exactly what types of bacteria are changing um, and um, what sorts of clinical um, parameters um, they are associating with. So for work in progress, um, we are um, evaluating the inflammatory biomarkers um, in, uh, in the diet cohort, um, particularly the um, particular inflammatory markers decrease um, with particular diet components. Um, and does that lead to also correlate with an improvement in symptom burden? Uh, further ongoing analysis of the microbiome. And we're now have just uh, opened a second study of a totally online diet intervention. Our first one was in person. And we had a lot of people who were interested in participating, but because they physically needed to be in Southern California um, for the di dietitian counseling, that was a little bit limiting. Um, so we're now starting a, um, a pilot study of everything being, being online. And that was um, a little while ago. Um, and uh, so um, for acknowledgments, I'd like to uh, thank everyone who was involved in this in this study, um, both um, research uh, coordinators as well as I, I should have put on this on this slide. Really, we um, we really owe a debt of gratitude to the patients who were involved on the study. Um, but Laura Mendez, who is a PhD student in my lab, um, she, um, she ran the bulk of the study. Um, and this study was um, a collaboration between an uh, epidemiology investigator at UC Irvine named Andy. Um, Helen and Jenny uh, were undergrads in my lab and have both now moved on to medical school and were really um, instrumental in um, calling patients and helping them schedule their appointments. Um, and Katrine and Julio um, are um, our microbiome collaborators at UC Irvine. Um, and for the cytokine analysis, um, where I'm uh, honored to be able to um, utilize the expertise of uh, Ruben, um, Amy Lou, and Heidi um, for, um, for help with analysis and, and hope to continue those collaborations. Um, for subsequent studies.
So thank you very much.